standing. <clears throat> Children's church this morning? Well, then get out of here. Again, I hear they have suckers the size of your head if you want to go to children's church. All right. Well, we're going to start a new series in the book of Ruth. Some of you have made great comments about my shirt. Yes, I am plugging for a pastoral endorsement from Ford. I am hoping they provide me vehicles to drive, and I will gladly put an emblem on my shirts every Sunday if they would just do that. I don't think that's going to happen, though, but... No, I just like the shirt, and I like blue, and it was on sale. I had to buy it. It was on sale, right? It might have been $100 marked down to 99 but it was on sale. It's like the light and the moth. I got to go to the light. We're going to be in the book of Ruth, and I have no fancy uh, great videos to show this morning or, or not even a PowerPoint because this morning – um, it's just going to lend itself to basic conversation and talking, all right? Um, before we get in the book of Ruth, the one thing as pastors sometimes we forget to do is put ourselves in your spot, N not so much the pews, you know, because if I was in your spot, I think I'd want some of that new temper material on the pew seats, you know, so I could sit there more comfortable with something like that. But the idea is, do you guys have the same knowledge and understanding about what we're going to talk about as I do? And the truth of the matter is, you don't. I mean, that's why you pay me the big bucks. Um, I'm still waiting for that check, by the way, the big buck check. But that's why you hire the pastors. I'm supposed to research and study and know what I'm talking about and bring it to you. Well, this morning, I want to make sure that we all, as we move through the book of Ruth, understand what's going on in the book of Ruth. Because it's easy to bring out that one favorite section that everybody loves, where Ruth says, Naomi, I'm not going to leave your side. You know, and that's just all so amazing, you know, a made for Hollywood moment for sure. But there's a whole lot more that is going on in the book of Ruth. I mean, you've got some, some serious seduction going on in the book of Ruth. I don't know if you've read it, but it's some pretty serious stuff going on there. You've got some people that are pretty selfish in the book of Ruth. But before we get into that, let's talk about the times of Ruth. Now, we all understand that Israel was in bondage for quite some time in the land of Egypt, right? And as they grew, the Egyptians said they will take over our land if we do not subdue them. So they put them to work, and they put them under the whip, under the task. They made them not even second class, not even third class, class but like fourth class citizens. I mean, they were nothing. And they cried out to God, and God heard their cries, and he brought a deliverer, Moses, you know, we know the stories of them leading out into the desert, all of God's actions and his movements. After that, you know, rises up another leader in Joshua. And Joshua was the one that actually led them into the land. He's the one that saw Jericho fall. He's the one that saw the, the land conquered. Joshua actually is the guy that gets all the credit for a lot of the hard work that Moses did. You missed that because Moses didn't do hard work. God's the one that always did the work. But Joshua is the one that gets to lead them in there. And after Joshua, um, we're going to be, I'm going to hit Joshua chapter 24 real quick before we jump to Ruth. But in Joshua 24, we have that amazing final farewell, if you will. He's about to go out of office and off into the sunset, and, and he addresses Israel one more time. And he warns them. He says, you know, God brought you all of this way. And he recounts in more detail the stuff that I just kind of skipped over to get to an overview here. But he says, God has done these amazing things. And we get to verse 14, and he says, uh, Joshua 24, 14, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river in Egypt, and serve the Lord. If it is agreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river. Y you like how he says beyond the river? Do you like how he tries to put in their mind this vast distance between idol worship and worshiping the one true God? He wasn't just saying it because it sounded good and he needed to fill up 500 pages to turn it into his, to his uh, master's thesis supervisor so he would get full credit for his master's thesis. He was trying to paint an image to them. Those gods are far away 
They're insignificant. They're on the other side of the river, a long journey away from where we're all today. God is here with us today. And, and he's challenging them. He says, um, beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. In other words, the gods who you kind of don't know, but we've been plundering their temples and smashing their, their places of worship. He says, don't look to those gods either. And then he says that famous line that we've heard in church a million times if you've been in church very long. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua, the great leader, says, I don't care what you do. I know what I'm going to do. And we're going to, we, my family, is going to pursue God no matter what it costs. And Israel, of course, because it's an emotional time, um, emotions can carry us away. They say, of course, Joshua, we are going to follow the one true God. You have shown him to us in the way you've led. We have seen him conquer lands in front of us. We are going to serve the one true God. And, Joseph, and Joshua turns around and he says, you can't serve him. You don't understand. God doesn't put up with your shenanigans the way I do. He won't be as loving and peaceable as you turn to other gods. He won't forget that you didn't give him the money and the tithe that was due him. He won't forget that you forgot the feast. He won't forget when you go and you worship in those false, those false tabernacles. But Israel again says, okay, Joshua, we understand what you're telling us, but we ain't scared. We're going to follow God just like you said. And then you hit from Joshua, you get to this book called Judges. What a name of a book, Judges. When I think of Judges, I think Judge Dredd. Sylvester Stallone, all his body armor, that gun that will turn into a, a bomb shooter and an automatic pistol all in the right in the palm of your hand. When we can get one of those, Haney, we need one of them guns. Armor piercing. I don't know what all settings were on there. It was on just a couple weeks ago. That's why it's fresh in my mind. But that's kind of what the book of Judges is. Israel would fall away from God. They would do their own thing. They would get into deep, deep trouble. God would bring down an opposing force to, 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 to ravage their land, to put them in submission, so they would turn back to God, and, and then God would bring a judge in once they turned back to God to deliver them. <coughs> all the judges... Um, are listed there. If you want to read through the book of Judges, there's some amazing stories. Deborah and Barak, uh, of course, who can forget Samson, right? All those great movies of Samson in between the pillars and just knocking them down. You know, uh, Gideon, what a great story of Gideon. Gets all those guys out there and God dwindles them down to just, to just, a, just a minuscule force compared to the force he was going against. And even Samuel, Samuel was the last judge. But all of these guys would respond when God called on them <clears throat> to go and deliver Israel and bring them back. And then you get to the last verse of the book of Judges, which is right before Ruth. Ruth is set during the time of Judges. How do I know that? Well, it says right there in the first, book of Ruth, first uh, verse of Ruth. That's how I know that. There wasn't any research in that. I just read. But in the last verse of Judges, Judges 21, verse 25, in those days there was no king. Uh, in Israel, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Anybody seen illustrations this week of everyone doing what was right in their own eyes? Baltimore's on fire. New York came down again. Why? Because people decided they could do what was right in their own eyes. Right? I, I don't have to respect authority. I can throw rocks at police officers. I don't have to respect other people's property because I am in so much pain, it only makes sense that someone else feels my pain. That's what they're doing, correct? So we're going to burn it down. Notice what the last verse says, because there was no king in Israel. Who was supposed to be the king of Israel? Saul? No. The Bible was clear that Saul wasn't supposed to be the king. Well, it's got to be David then, right? Because David was the best king. He was the man after God's own heart. No, David was never supposed to be king of Israel either. God was supposed to be their king. He had shown himself time and time again how he came through. He gave them these laws to live by. He gave them a code to live by. And, and, and you think our code is bad. His code was even worse. 
I mean, accidental killing were to be responded by with that person's life being taken if they couldn't get to a city of refuge in time. I mean, God's justice was pure and it was exact and, and he was to be their ruler. What the end of Judges is saying is because all of the rules had been cast off, because they had no longer looked to God, no longer submitted themselves to his word, everyone did what was right in their own eyes and things were just a mess. And then we get to Ruth. Her story is, is set probably in the time of Gideon and the judges when there was an unruly time in Israel. Even Gideon, even though he brought deliverance to the people, his son, Gideon raised a bunch of sons that were just terrible. He had concubines and wives. I think he had 70 sons or 70 children. I can't remember which. But he had one son that killed all of the other sons except for one so that he could be the ruler in Israel. I mean, Gideon just wasn't an example of a great father either. But Ruth is probably set during that time period. So let's get to the book of Ruth. Ruth uh, 1, one. It says, Now it came about in those days that judges governed, and there was a famine in the land. Again, God punishing Israel for not following his laws, for not submitting. He brought about a famine. He's trying to get their attention. Kind of like when your parents call out your middle name. Right? George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Wolf, get in here right now. You're in trouble when all those middle names start coming out. And I have two middle names myself, Scott Richard Allen Wolf. It took my mom longer to call than my other brothers. Corey John Wolf. I mean, they had a short period of time to turn around. I at least had almost a second and a half. And a certain man in Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. Verse 2, the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his sons were Malon and Chilion, uh, Epaphroditus of Bethlehem and Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died as she was left with her two sons. Now understand, because of the famine, because there was there was no food to eat in Bethlehem, the place that he was supposed to be, the place that Elimelech was supposed to be. He did what any one of us as caring fathers and providers for our family would do. He went to a place where there was food. The only problem with Elimelech going to Moab was God didn't want him in Moab. Now, now let me get this personal to you. There are times in our lives that God allows circumstances to come into our lives that push us to a breaking point. And it's not because God doesn't love us that he allows those times to come into our life. It's because he does love us. The New Testament is clear. Who the Lord loves, he disciplines. My kids crying and bawling after I have applied the Board of Education to the proper area of their anatomy. In other words, I swatted them on the behind, for those of you who didn't get that. When they're done and they're sobbing and I grab them and I say, you know your dad loves you. And I don't even tell them that it hurts me more than it hurts you because I know that's not true right now. They don't understand that thought. As parents, it sounds good when we say it. But when your backside is painted red, you aren't thinking about how much your dad's hurting. But I tell them, you know I love you. I had to discipline you because the way you're doing things is causing hurt to either your disrespect in your mom or your disrespect in other people. They need to know that. Uh, Elimelech was just being a good dad, but the problem was instead of staying under the discipline that God was bringing to Israel to eventually bring about a healing and bring about a revival, they decided, no, I'm picking up my ball and I'm going home, God. And what happened? Well, Ruth tells us, the, story, the book of Ruth tells us that Elimelech died. And then he talks about his sons. And they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of them, one was Orpah and the other one was Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years, verse 5. Then both Malion and Chilion also died. And the women were bereft of her two children and her husband. What a penalty to pay 
for a man who was doing what he thought was good, which was providing for his family, but he forgot that God had told the nation of Israel to stay in the land that I had given you. But there's no food, God. I, I can't see my crops growing. I need to step outside of your will and provide for my family. And God judged him for it. Do you know how I know this principle is still true today? Because I am living proof that when there's things that, that, that I haven't planned for or that I don't have provision for, and, and, and Satan has provided this amazing thing called plastic. And I take that plastic when hard times come and when they're having a sale on shirts or guns or ammo or sewing machines or crocheting needles. God forbid there be a sale on longer burger baskets or Tupperware. Hold us back now. And I take that amazing piece of plastic and I slide it through the machine or I put it on the internet and get, get my stuff. And then the bill comes due. And now I'm under a mountain of debt because I stepped, stopped, stepped outside of the discipline of being careful with my money, of knowing that I don't have the money now. But I want, so I'm going to make it happen. But timing and provision is important. God provides, guys. God provides. Elimelech stepped outside, and he paid a price. Verse 6, Then she arose with her two daughters-in-law, and that they might return from the land of the Moab. For she had learned at the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So in other words, the famine didn't kill everyone in Israel. Because there were still people there. Word got back that, hey, things are good again. The rains have come. The crops are coming in. And Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with me. Uh, excuse me, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. In other words, she's saying, because you were so nice to my, to my sons and to me, you need to go back to your family. Um, verse 9, may the Lord grant you that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. In other words, she's telling them, get remarried. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices, and they wept. Imagine that. You get women together long enough, and they're going to end up crying. It, it just happens. And then they said to her, no, wait a minute. But we will surely return with you to your people. At this point, both daughters say, we're not going to leave you, Naomi. We understand that you have nothing, and we are all you have. We're staying with you. <clears throat> but Naomi said, return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters, for I am too old for the husband. If I said I have hope, if I should ever have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marriage? No, my daughters, for it is harder uh, for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone against me. I emphasize the word I in there for a reason. If you notice, Naomi's what seems to be a generous gesture to these two ladies is wrapped up in selfishness and self-pity. I don't have a husband. I don't have any more sons to give you. I can't do this. I can't do that. She is unwilling to accept the love and the grace that has been given freely to her by Orpah and by Ruth. When I read this, this isn't original to me. I read it in the two commentaries this week because I was background studying. I had never heard a pastor preach on this passage like that. But when I read it, a light bulb came on. How many times have we tried to act in love toward people? Or if people tried to act in love toward us, and we decided that we could do it on our own. But see, guys, that's not the way that God designed us. He designed us for relationship. Today we are in church because God said, I want all of my people to gather in a local area where they can encourage one another, strengthen one another, even correct one another in love, where you guys can do amazing things in the communities where you live. That's why we're a church. 
But we can't do it if we're all saying, I want it my way. Naomi said she wanted it her way. She was even doling out grace on her terms. I can't give you another son so you can have another husband. The selfishness. But understand this about Naomi. The selfishness came out of a heart of hurt. This woman had lost everything. And I, I, and I want you to think about this. She knew their land was in Bethlehem. That's why the, the, the first few verses tells us where he's from. She knew where she was supposed to be. She knew she wasn't there. And imagine now as she looks back 10 to 15 years and sees how everything is fine. Remember, it wasn't like today where we find out instantly. It probably took some time for the news to get to them that everything was fine back in, back in Bethlehem. Can you imagine the guilt she held on to? If I only hadn't left. If I only would have trusted God. But unlike her husband, Naomi corrects the course. She says, I'm going back to where I belong. And I believe there is love in wanting the two daughters to stay with their family. There may be some selfishness behind it, but I believe she did care for them. You know, there was love shown by Jesus Christ on the cross. Even though we would say, I don't want that, Jesus. I should be on the cross. That's, that's selfishness again, isn't it? God, I'm going to tell you how I am going to provide salvation for my soul. I'm going to keep this rule. I'm going to keep that rule. Well, I can't keep that rule, so I'll need grace for that one, God. But that's the only one I need grace on. I'll keep this rule. I'll keep that rule. Oh, that rule. I'm going to need grace on that rule, too. But I'm going to keep the rest of them. The Bible is clear. It's all or nothing. Either you can save yourself all the way or you need all of Jesus. <coughs> Ruth, Naomi, and Orpah had a decision to make. <coughs> it was all or nothing. Naomi had decided, I had done wrong. My family had done wrong by coming into Moab. It's time to return back to where God is blessed. There is a price to pay for the actions they chose. She lost the men in her family. But the pain of staying away from God was too great for her to bear. She had to get back in to where she belonged. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. I don't know where you are in your life. I don't know if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, if you understand that He loves you so much, not because of what you do, but because of who you are. You are made in God's image. And God said, because you're made in my image, even though you've made bad choices, I don't want to be apart from you. If you've never accepted Him as your Savior, today is the day. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe you are like Naomi. Maybe you ran away from God. Things were getting tough. You know, God was expecting some things or some things didn't exactly go my way and I had to provide for my family or I had to get out of the, the, the trauma or the drama or, or whatever the excuse was. You moved away from what God wanted. Maybe it's time this morning you returned. Maybe you're looking for a place that you can belong. You know that church has been on your radar, but it's been hard to find a place. I'm here to tell you, Keys Baptist Church may not be the place for you because we're not perfect. We mess up. I messed up last week once. It's all right, though. I ask forgiveness from God, and we're good. I kid about it, but we are a group of imperfect people trying to serve a perfect God imperfectly. But God can take our imperfection, and he can turn it into something great. That's the whole story of Ruth. This morning we talked about the tragedy. The tragedy is going to keep coming up as we go throughout the book. But as we continue in this series, we're going to move from tragedy to an amazing legacy. In a male-dominated society, there are four women mentioned in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Several of them are not Jews. And one of them is Ruth. This Moabite. This lady who was dealt harshly. 
from a foreign land who turns and accepts, puts herself under the lordship of God, Jehovah, during this time. And we find her name in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Hope you're able to keep coming back as we go through the book of Ruth together, as we, as we uncover these amazing stories, these amazing illustrations of how God redeems and provides, even, even when we have walked away and made a mess of our lives. God can take our tragedy, and he can turn it into a legacy. Let's bow for a closing word of prayer. Father.